talking about the first one, which was how to extend the special theory of relativity to include accelerations as well as velocities. And today we'll be doing something about the other motivations. Let me just remind you what they were. There's the fact that Newtonian gravity was incompatible with special relativity. Einstein was intrigued by the equivalence principle, the fact that all bodies fall with equal acceleration in a gravitational field. And then there was the whole issue of coordinates in physics and what they mean. <clears throat> so we started talking a little about this. If you remember that the four-dimensional space-time has distances that look like this. And that minus sign is crucial. And one feature that uh, one might mention in this, in this context is causality. If you take the square of a vector, well, v squared means in our notation, the Minkowski metric e to mu nu times v mu v nu, which with our convention of raising indices, we could write v mu up, v mu down, repeating the index. That's the same thing. But the important point to note is that the naught component comes in with a minus sign. So this can either be positive, zero, or negative. If we were in a Euclidean space where we had a plus sign here, that option would not be available. Everything would be positive. And we give a name to these. This is uh, vectors for which this is bigger than zero are called space-like, for which is zero are called light-like, and which are less than zero time-like. <clears throat> and we can draw a picture with time going vertically and space horizontally. We have to limit our diagram to one space, but of course there are, there's one coming out of the blackboard as well. Let me ignore that one for a moment. And the fact that there's one time means that there's a unique meaning to the future going up that way and the past. And particles that travel less than the speed of light, which they have to, unless they're massless, in which case they travel at the speed of light, are confined to lie in that cone that we call the light cone. And two events are said to be causally connected if they lie inside 
each other's light cone. Which is another way of saying their separation is time-like. If their separation were space-like, there'd be no way that one event could influence the other. So there's no causal connection between the two events. In order that there be a causal connection, their separation must be time-like which in another way of saying it is that event A lies inside the light cone of event B. And the symmetry that leaves this distance invariant is the Lorentz symmetry, or more generally the Poincaré symmetry. And you can check, and maybe this would be an exercise, that these are the most general set of transformations that leave this invariant. You can find that in Weinberg page 27, if you want to look it up. But as Einstein noted, the Lorentz group singles out for special consideration those frames of reference that are in uniform relative motion with respect to one another. So, velocity is a relative concept, but acceleration is not. And many people, including the philosopher Ernst Mach, thought that perhaps acceleration ought to be put on a similar footing as velocity in this respect. Einstein was aware of Mach's ideas, but he later said that it did not influence him that much for finding his theory. So let's now, we'll come back to various features of special relativity and see how they're extended to general relativity. But for now, let's look at Newtonian gravitation. Newton's law can be written like this, and I'll explain what the symbols mean in just a moment. N sub n, d2, x, n, dt squared, is big G sum over m, m sub n, m sub m, x m minus x n over x m minus x n modulus cubed. So this is basically force is mass times acceleration. <coughs> and the uh, the symbols uh, m sub n is the mass of the nth particle. Let's suppose we have n particles. x sub n, which is a function of time, is the position of that particle. 
at time t. And there you have it. The, uh, there's an inverse square law telling you the gravitational force between the two particles, one with mass mn, the other with mass mn, with in general many particles. And this is the force on that nth particle. Now, Newton's theory has its own relativity, if you like, but it's not Einstein's relativity. There is a symmetry of Newton's equations, which looks like this. Let's suppose we have a new three vector x, which is r times x plus v times t plus d, where r is a orthogonal matrix and t prime is t plus tau, and v, d, and tau are real constants. Now, as a matter of fact, this set of transformations forms a group. It's called the... Uh, Galileo group. It has ten parameters. Three components of the velocity, three distances, a time, and then the rotation matrix add up to ten. And this is sometimes called Galilean relativity. Now you notice it's different from Lorentz transformations. The translation part is similar, but the uh, The rest is not. And Einstein said, uh, there are many more transformations. which do not. leave Newton's laws invariant. For example, if you were to go to a uh, rotating frame of reference, you would be forced to change that equation. It would no longer be the right one because Rotating frames of reference do not lie in this allowed set of transformations. Now, it was a mystery. I suppose this is, dates back to 1686, roughly speaking. It was a mystery in 1686 what determines those frames of reference for which this is the right equation. And we made some progress, or Einstein did in 1905, with special relativity. But special relativity had its own mystery. Why were the frames of reference in which the Lorentz transformations hold occupy a special status? So we just swapped one problem for another 
we'd swapped the Galilean inertial frames for the Lorentzian inertial frames. But we still didn't really know why those frames should occupy some special status. Well, Einstein put these questions aside for a while and said, um, can we make Newton relativistic in the Lorentz sense? Well, many people tried. Let me tell you what the sort of thing they did. Um, in Newton's law, you have dx by dt squared is minus the gradient of some potential phi of x. <clears throat> and phi of x obeyed a Poisson type equation del squared phi of x is 4 pi g rho of x, where rho of x is the de density of some material. So what you might try to make this look more Lorentzian is to replace x by x mu which is the four vector, and t by ds squared, where s is the proper time that appears in this formula. That looks more uh, Lorentzian. And to make this compatible, we'd have to replace the spatial derivative by the time derivative and phi would have to depend on all four coordinates by a four derivative, I should say, not a time derivative, but one with respect to this four vector x mu. And then you'd replace this by the d'Alembertian, which is a phi, which is minus... d2 by dt squared plus del squared phi because this combination minus d2 by dt squared plus del squared is a Lorentz invariant operator unlike the spatial del squared. And then you'd put this equal to 4 pi g rho of x mu. Now that's an attempt, a brave attempt, you might say, to make Newton's law of gravity compatible with Einstein's special theory of relativity. But Einstein was not impressed. And... Uh, main reason was it still didn't address this issue of the equivalence principle. So this is what he got thinking about next. And this is what we're going to talk about now. And this is where the famous elevator comes in. And he started by thinking about somebody, stick man, inside an elevator. Yeah? I was just wondering who made that attempt to relevant. 
A very good question, and uh, I'd have to look it up. I can't remember. I think the, there was not one person, but several, um, several people involved with that. But since it didn't work, their names have been lost in history. Um, I'll, I'll look that up for you. Okay, we've got Stickman inside his elevator, and he has a baseball which he uh, can drop if he wants to. And he's in free fall. And let's imagine, that here's the Earth. But to begin with, and this will prove to be important, and we'll relax it in a few moments, we're going to assume this is a flat Earth. Now, what's so special about a flat Earth as opposed to a round one? If we had a round Earth, so let's just uh, do this on a separate board. So here's, here's the Earth of radius R. Here's a particle located at coordinate distance r from the center of the Earth. And the force is g, and the Earth has mass m, and this has mass little m. And the force is g m m over r squared. But we can write h as the height above the Earth. So r equals r plus h. And we can define g to be big G m over the radius squared. So in that case, this is mg r squared over r plus h squared squared. Now what's a flat Earth? A flat Earth is one where we take the radius going to infinity while keeping little g fixed. And that's just mg. So The gravitational field of a round Earth changes with R, but with the flat Earth, it's constant. And we'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> so here's our friend in the elevator falling towards a flat Earth. And let's compare this situation with where the elevator is at rest on the surface of the Earth. In this situation, if our friend drops his baseball, it will fall to the ground. Whereas when both are in free fall, it will stay where he is. Now let's compare this situation
with the situation when there's no gravitational field, but the elevator suffers an upwards acceleration. Let's suppose we put the uh, elevator on a pulley and we haul it up with an acceleration g. That's also going to fall. <coughs> so this is situation one, situation two, situation three. And the observer inside the elevator cannot tell the difference. between two and three. So whether his baseball is falling to the ground because, I guess it would be more sensible to have him not floating in midair there, wouldn't it? Um, if his baseball is falling to the ground because the earth is pulling it down with acceleration g, or whether somebody's pulling on the rope with acceleration g, he can't tell the difference. So at least in a homogeneous gravitational field, and I'll quote what Einstein said, in a homogeneous gravitational field, And that was the importance of the flat Earth, that you have a homogeneous field. All motions take place as in the absence of a gravitational field. relation to a uniform accelerated coordinate system. Bit of a mouthful, actually, but these are Einstein's words. But you can probably say it more succinctly. is basically just what we've said, that we can't tell the difference between situation two and situation three. And this has far-reaching consequences. It's amazing what, uh, just thinking about things clearly, as Einstein could do better than anyone else, reveals some remarkable features. For example, let's suppose we 
let go of the rope in situation three. And let's suppose um, someone cuts a window in his elevator and shines a light through the window. That's what will happen. But suppose now we tug on the rope. What's the observer going to see? Well, you'll see the light ray bent. Because he's accelerating upwards. But according to what we've just been saying, this situation is entirely equivalent the guy who's sitting on the flat earth, from which Einstein concluded right. So that's a remarkable piece of uh, clever thinking by Einstein. Just thinking about thought experiments, he concluded that light had to be bent by a gravitational field. Now this was all very well, but what we have to bear in mind is that this is the flat earth situation. What happens with the real Earth? Well, let me, before we go on to the real Earth, let me rephrase what we've said in slightly different language. There's this long as the field is homogeneous, we can always choose a coordinate system coordinate system will be the freely falling coordinate system. In which the laws of physics those in the absence of a gravitational figure, which means special relativity. So at least for the flat Earth, the fellow who's in free fall can use the rules of special relativity and he'll get the right answer. But
suppose our friend drops a baseball from his left hand and another one from his right hand in the situation where there's a real round earth, they'll both head for the center of the earth. So what does he see? He sees them drawing slightly closer together. This effect is called a tidal effect. And it's happening because the gravitational field in this case is not homogeneous. It depends on how far above the Earth the elevator is. So here's where the equivalence principle, as it's sometimes called, that you can't tell the difference between a gravitational field and an acceleration, has to be modified because it's not quite true now. Uh, uh, we can tell the difference, but what is true is that we can neglect the gravitational field locally. What do I mean by locally? I mean, if we're looking over sufficiently small distances, It's hard to tell whether the balls are falling in a parallel line or drawing closer together. Question? Right. Yeah. So, exactly. So, the we can neglect the gravitational field only in a sufficiently small region. In that sufficiently small region, you can't tell whether the balls are falling in, in parallel line or whether they're going closer together. If you look at the big picture, you can see that you can't ignore the gravitational field. It matters. But we still have some remnant of what we said earlier if we confine ourselves to a sufficiently small region. And uh, accordingly, Einstein reformulated the principle. Would you mind reminding us briefly where the tidal effect has that name? Tidal effect? Yeah. Well, um, uh, It obviously comes from the tides. Uh, no, no prizes for that. Um, I don't think the word is particularly appropriate. I'm giving you his historical title. But um, when we come to do geometry, we'll realize that the difference between the two situations is when the curvature is non-zero. In one case, the Riemann tensor is zero. In the other case, it isn't. And whenever you have the non-vanishing Riemann tensor, historically, that was called tidal. Um, I wouldn't uh, 
place too much emphasis on it right now. But whenever you see the words title, that's what they're talking about. So, we reformulate the equivalence principle to take this into account. I mean, on the Earth, the tides are caused by the moon, of course. But um, I'm not sure that that helps you understand the point I'm trying to make, so I didn't want to make too big a deal of that. So well, how do we uh, reformulate the equivalence principle? It says, at every space-time point, in an arbitrary gravitational field, It's possible to choose a locally inertial coordinate system. such that within a sufficiently small region, and again, this is rather a mouthful, but I think it's what Einstein, the way Einstein phrased it. of nature take the same form as in unaccelerated Cartesian coordinates. I'd forgotten how long-worded this was. In the absence of gravitation. But it's essentially saying in a long-winded way what we had up here, that within a sufficiently small region, he can pretend that the laws of physics are just those of special relativity. It's only when you venture out a little ways you realize that gravity is at work, and that's not quite right. Now... And again, this was Einstein's genius. He said, this reminds you of something. The fact that um, you can almost pretend that there's no curvature, but eventually you have to admit that there is, is a bit like if you were a map maker. And if you wanted to make a map of the London Underground, you wouldn't need to know that the Earth was round, 
Right? A flat Earth would be a pretty good approximation. But if you're trying to work out the timetable of some, if you work for an airline and you're trying to work out how long it takes to fly from A to B, then the curvature of the Earth is important. So whether you take the curvature into account or not all depends on how local you want to be. So let's look at the Earth. Let's look at the North Pole. And if you have coordinates psi 1, psi 2, For the, in a small region, about the pole, it's a good approximation to say that the distance between two points is just the conventional flat space, psi 1 squared plus psi 2 squared. But that's not possible to do that globally. If I want to calculate the distance between two points on the sphere, that's not a good uh, description. So let's suppose we have some other coordinate system that does cover the sphere. And let's call this other coordinate system x1, x2. In that case, and I'll write it down and I'll explain what I'm doing in just a moment. Where these coefficients tell you how to go from one coordinate system to the other, give you an example I have it what I mean For example, if we used polar coordinates so that some point 
on the sphere is at an angle theta to the vertical and the angle around the sphere, the azimuthal angle, is phi, then the map maker, the flat earth fellow, would say this is sine theta cos phi, sine theta sine phi, And in that case, you can work it out that the 1, 1 component or the theta, theta component equals cos squared theta. The theta phi component is zero. And the phi phi component is sine squared theta. But that's only valid around the North Pole. If I venture far enough away from the North Pole, that's not a good approximation. And because the right answer is actually 1, 0 sine squared theta. I want to calculate the distance between two points on the surface of the sphere. But within a sufficiently small region, this is a good approximation. So the map maker who's making the London Underground wouldn't go far wrong with that approximation. But if he's trying to work out the time taken to fly from London to Sydney, then he'd get it badly wrong. Now, Einstein noted a similarity between the approximation of flat space versus curved space and the approximation of having a gravitational field versus no gravitational field. And this is where the first inklings that the right theory might be geometrical entered into the game. And we'll, in tomorrow's lecture, see further how the notion of curvature, curved space, and geometry, and the notions of gravitational field and the equivalence principle all fit together nicely in Einstein's picture. Any questions? In the, in, in the, uh, yes, yes, sorry. This is d psi 1, dx 1. I was a bit sloppy with upstairs and downstairs. Um, I guess I've got them all down. Sorry, was there a remark? Let, let me, um, okay, we can work it out. Because it's, it's. That's the rule I'm using. So let me be a bit more careful. G11 is d psi 1 
dx1 squared plus d psi2 dx2 squared. d12 is d psi1 dx1 d psi2 dx2 plus d psi2 dx1 um, sorry that should be 1 that should be 2 and g22 should be d psi1 dx2 squared plus d psi2 dx2 squared. So my apologies, I was a bit sloppy with this one. That's what I should have written. And these x's should have been upstairs. Is that clearer? No, situation two is not arbitrary, it's homogeneous. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's, in the final minute, recap. Let's start. First of all, we have free fall. And then we have, that's the same as, uh, so that's the same as this, there were no earth. If he's at rest on the surface of the earth, the ball will fall to the ground. And that's the same as if there were no earth, but someone's pulling on the rope. So we had the weaker form of the equivalence principle said that when the earth is flat, in other words, when everything is homogeneous, you can't tell the difference between acceleration and gravity. However, that was only strictly true when the gravitational field was homogeneous for the flat Earth. When we go to the round Earth case, we have to... We have to modify that statement. Well, where's the round Earth gone? I guess it's disappeared. Did I erase the strongest ver version of the... Uh... Right. So, in the flat Earth situation, that statement was valid everywhere, globally. 
in the curved Earth situation where the, the gravitational field is not homogeneous, it's true, but it's only true locally. So that's where we say that it's possible that within a sufficiently small region, the laws of nature are the same as in the unaccelerated coordinate system. See, this fellow He looks to see what happens, and they fall in a par they fall parallel. His friend in the real Earth sees them almost parallel, but they're drawing slightly closer together. Now, over a sufficiently small region, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's only after you've fallen a certain way and you see them getting closer together that you realize the Earth is round, folks. So. The principle of equivalence that was straightforward in the flat Earth case is still true, but it's true only locally in a sufficiently small region. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But since we haven't yet done the metric and the Riemann tensor, I don't want to do that today. But it's, it's exactly right. That mathematically, what you are doing is you're ignoring first derivatives of the metric tensor with respect to space and time, but not second derivatives. That's, that will be another way of saying it when we come to do the geometry. But I just want to give you the physics feeling for the moment without the maths. Yeah? You can't tell. In the homogeneous case, you can't tell. In the non-homogeneous case, you can tell by watching how the baseballs grow closer together. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about just the source of our expressions for these um, G coefficients. And if you can say, like, what should I accept them? What should I believe them? Why should you believe them? Yeah. Well, I guess I've jumped a little bit. It's a good question. I've jumped a little bit of telling you how to go from one coordinate system to another. And I implied I used that rule that I wrote down. And uh, to justify that will require a little more introduction to geometry than I've done so far. So you're, you're asking a good question. And the best way I can answer it is that I'll be filling in the gaps when we do the geometry, the metric, and, the, and we'll see, uh, as was mentioned before, how the difference between the homogeneous gravitational field and the non-homogeneous gravitational field will be the curvature of space-time. So, what this is leading up to with Einstein thinking about the analogy between curvature and the uh, flatness and the analogy between a homogeneous gravitational field and a non-homogeneous gravitational field is that in Riemannian geometry, which describes curved surfaces, the Minkowski metric, which before was eta mu nu dx mu dx nu, gets replaced by 
a metric that depends on space and time, called g mu nu. That's the mathematics. g mu nu tells you the difference between one point in a curved space time and another. And that was, the mathematics of all that was developed in the 19th century by Riemann and others. What Einstein realized was that this metric is to be identified with the gravitational field. So the gravitational field is not a scalar quantity as those nameless heroes were uh, suggesting that del squared phi equals rho. The gravitational field is a tensor field. It's a four by four matrix which depends itself on where you are in space time. So the metric over here is different from the metric over here or in changes in time as well. And this was Einstein's great contribution, was to identify that metric with the gravitational field. Now, so the next stage after we finish this part of the course, the next stage will be to develop the mathematics of Riemannian geometry, which we'll need to tackle Einstein's theory. But simply knowing that that's the gravitational field is not enough. You also have to know what are the right equations for the gravitational field. Riemann didn't tell Einstein that part of the story. And this was uh, also another great contribution of Einstein, was to write down the correct field equations for gravity. There'll be second order partial differential equations, just like Maxwell's equations, but there'll be nonlinear equations so much more complicated and much more difficult to solve. But second order partial differential equations, nonetheless. Uh, any other questions? Yeah? When I was just um, seeing these expressions for the first time for the G coefficients and trying to make sense of them, um, one of the first things that comes to mind is the Jacobian because it also relates coordinates to each other and involves partial derivatives. And well, in that case, involves the volume element, how that transforms the changes of coordinates. So is we'll there some doing, relation? We'll, yes, there is, and we'll be doing all that in the, in the day or two. Okay. So let me show you. We'll we'll do it, but not today. Yeah. If we want, if we want to see um, the lack of design, we need a very strong gravitational field. For the bending of light? Yes. Well, uh, <coughs> I can tell you how it works. This bending of light, which Einstein predicted from his thought experiment, was put to the test in 1919, I think it was, by Arthur Eddington. Some people say Eddington cheated and got the answer he was looking for. But uh, whether or not that's true, it's now been confirmed. Uh, and what they did was, here's Earth, here's some star. Uh, under normal circumstances, light from the star will hit the Earth. But according to Einstein, if you have the sun, light will be bent by any gravitational field. For example, the gravitational field of the sun should bend light. So someone on Earth would think that the star was over here. Now, looking at the sun is difficult, except when there's a total eclipse. So that's the time that Eddington chose to do his experiment. So you look at the sky when the sun isn't there. 
And then you look at the sky again where the sun's in the sky, and uh, with a total eclipse you can then see the star that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. And you can measure the angle that by which the uh, light ray is bent and uh, compare that with Einstein's prediction. And it turns out to be... can't remember what the formula is now. We'll, we'll be doing it in a later class. But the prediction is in good agreement with Einstein. It's rather a difficult experiment to do, but the prediction of Einstein's theory is in good agreement with experiment. And... Uh, Someone said to Einstein, what would you have done if they hadn't seen the bending of light? And he said, well, then I'd feel sorry for the good Lord because the theory's correct. So he was convinced that his theory was correct before they did the experiment. And of course, as usual, he was right. He wasn't always right. He got it wrong on quantum mechanics a few times, but as far as relativity is concerned. And he also was skeptical about the existence of black holes. Um, shortly after he wrote down his equations in 1916, Carl Schwarzschild came up with an exact solution describing a spherically symmetric body and uh, noted that uh, if the body is sufficiently inside its so-called Schwarzschild radius, then it would be, light could not escape and the body would be a black hole. This had been put forward actually in the uh, 1780s by the British clergyman, uh, John Michel, and the French physicist uh, Laplace, who looked at the uh, escape velocity of a body from a planet or a star and ask themselves what would happen if the mass was sufficiently strong that the and the radius sufficiently small that the escape velocity approached the velocity of light. And they concluded that in that case, if R If R is less than GM in appropriate units, then light could not escape from such a body and it would be black, hence the black hole. Einstein was skeptical that such objects actually existed and thought that this was a mathematical uh, curiosity and nothing more. Uh, so he was wrong about that, but uh, again, most of the time he was right. Any other questions? Yes, yes, please. F is called the Maxwell field strength. J is called the current, electric current. Including when you write it as a Yes. Why does well, um, the question is how do you combine how do you combine uh, electric fields and magnetic fields in a relativistic way? And the rule was
that you put the uh, three electric fields together that way, and you put the uh, F12 is B3, F23 is B2, B1, and F31 is B2. <coughs> Well, there's two motivations, yes. One, they look, complicated equations look pretty as more economical. That's usually the test of beauty in physics if it's more economical. But also, you can see at a glance, if I write Maxwell's equations as d mu f mu mu equals j mu, I can see by inspection that it's invariant under Lorentz transformation which it wasn't apparent in the, it was true in the conventional way of writing them, but it's not obviously true. Once you write this in four vector notation, it's, there's no more work to be done. You can see that it's Lorentz invariant. So when you write the formulation of Well, it would obviously be post-Einstein, wouldn't it? Um, Again, you've got me on who wrote down Maxwell's equations in a relativistic form, first of all. I don't know the answer to that. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, we got, I mean, no hurry. No, because the effect is so tiny, you see. It's a very tiny angle that the light is bent through. So you need to do it over very big distances. What we can do on Earth, which is similar, is the gravitational redshift. Um, the frequency of light will change in a gravitational field. And you can test that by being at the bottom of um, the Tower of Pisa and the top of the Tower of Pisa. So on that sort of scale, the experiments are sensitive enough to uh, see an effect. But the bending of light, in this sense, is only on an astrophysical scale do we see that. 